these things you ought to know. That's kind of what we're talking about. Before ever even uh, salvation ever becoming an issue at all, I fell in love with the presence of the Lord. I didn't know about salvation. I thought, you know, everybody was saved, you know, just really didn't even really think about it, I guess, you know. But what I did know is I fell in love with the presence of God. I fell in love with him. And I realized when I came to that point in my life where, where I realized I did not want to be without the presence of God, then I began to search his word. How can I get closer to him? How can I feel his presence all the time? I don't want to be without him. And I began to search the scriptures. And then the Bible says, and in them you have life. And I found out, I found life in those scriptures. Amen. And so in Matthew 11, it says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He just wants you to learn of him. You know, we just need to learn of him. And as we learn of him, he begins to remove those yokes He begins to remove those weights. He begins to remove all those things that we had no business carrying in the first place. And then we, there's an exchanging of yokes that happens and praise God for that exchanging of yokes. Amen. So we're going to talk about these things you ought to know in the books of, in the book of Acts 17 and 11, you may stand if you want for the reading of the word. It says these were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. And so four things stood out to me in this. Now these... um, you know, the first of all, what I, what I see in that scripture, it says that they were, that they received the word with readiness of mind. They were, they, they, they had, they were open-minded. And so what I feel like is so relevant is that when your mind is open, very simply, it's not closed off. (laughs) If it's not open, it's closed. Amen. So it's not closed off to ideas or considerations and possibilities or possibilities brought forth by others. And what we have to understand about them in Macedonia back then, what we have to understand is they, they were worshiping Greek gods. They were worshiping, you know, what is it? 21 or 12 Greek gods, whatever they were worshiping. And then they had Judaism on top of it. And so for them to receive what Paul had to say with readiness of minds, they were open. They wanted to know. And so we need, when we are reading the scriptures, when we're reading the word, when we're learning of God, we need to have that readiness of mind. No matter what we think or no matter what we've gone through or no matter what we have learned, we need to be open to what God has for us. Amen. The second thing that kind of stands out to me in this scripture, it says that they listened or they received. So often we hear, but we don't listen. We don't. And there is a difference between hearing and listening. And so often we're not. There are so many voices that are speaking to us in our culture in today's time. We got it. We have to start listening to the word of God. Because that is the only thing that is going to drown out all the lies and all the error. That's the only thing that is going to be able to impart truth into our hearts. Amen. The next thing was there was an eagerness. To be eager means having or showing a strong desire or interest. Man, are you eager for the word of God? Man, I, I, I can't, I can't, pastor can, nobody can you know, impart an eagerness in your heart. We can't make you want to love God or want more of God. That's not our job. The only thing that we can do is give you God's word and God does the rest. That eagerness and that hunger and thirsting after righteousness, that's got to come from you. You got to be hungry. 
You got to be not so full of the things of this world and the things of this life that, that, that you are not eager or hungry for the things of God. And if you're not hungry for the things of God, if you are dreading going to church, dreading picking up your Bible, dreading listening to the pastor or the word, then there's a heart issue. There's an eagerness issue that we, that you need to address very quickly. And we've all been there. Right. We've all we've been hungry at sometimes and not so hungry at other times. Let's be honest. Amen. Something else that I notice in the last thing is because. Is is they searched the scriptures. Amen. They searched it. We hear a lot of stuff. <laughs> you could Google anything and you could. Well, it, it's got to be true because it's on Google. It's got to be true because I read it on the internet. It's got to be true because I heard it here. I heard it there. It's got to be true because it was spoken from the pulpit. It's got to be true. Well, I want to tell you, it is not always true. And the Bible says that we need to work out our own salvation with fear. And that means you got to be kind of a little afraid. I mean, this is eternity that is at stake here. We have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. You need to be fearful because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has an eternity for you. He's preparing a place for us. And once you're there, you're there. There are two places that you're going. And once you're there, there's no getting out. Amen. So you need to make sure that you're going to be in the right place and be fearful about it. We are, we prepare for so many things in this lifetime and we completely disregard eternity. Amen. No matter how eloquent a preacher or speaker, it doesn't matter the emotional strings. It strums in your heart and that goes both ways. You could get those warm and fuzzy feelings you could feel good, right, about the word of God. Oh, I felt so good. I got tingles. Or you could be completely turned off by the word of God, angry, and walk out angry and offended. Regardless of what you are feeling, amen, you need to make sure it is truth. And they did that by searching the scriptures. Eternity is at stake, amen, and you need to make sure. And so why did I say that? Why did I go through all this? Because these are the basics for really living for God. You need this. Amen. And so if you don't have those basics, if you're not hungering or thirsting after righteousness, if you're not checking the scriptures, if you don't have a readiness of mind, you might as well call it quits. Because you're not going to receive anything. Amen. So salvation is not an idea that humanity introduced to humanity. And some of you have heard this before, but that's okay. I'm going to say it again. Amen. Therefore, humanity cannot interpret it based upon his or her own understanding. It was not man's plan. Eternity was not. Salvation was not. So man can't change it. He can't tweak it. He can't adjust it as he, see fit. he sees fit. Heaven is not man's home, nor is heaven any person's rite of passage. Heaven is God's home, and just like your house, you get to invite who you want, and you get to set the rules and decide who's coming in and who's going out. So it doesn't matter. You could, you could have somebody stand at your doorstop begging to come in or demanding to come in, but if they are not following your rules, if they're not coming in and they're not doing what you're asking them to, then you don't need to let him in. And that is how it is with God. It is stated in both the book of Isaiah and Acts that heaven is God's throne and the earth is his footstool. They're not made by, they're not made by man's hands. It's God's resting place and he gets to make the rules. Secondly, the plan of salvation is given in his word. It says to repent and be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Realize, we need to realize that the word of God is the sole source of truth. We can't go outside the word of God to look for truth. That's a lie. Amen? And so, and we want to also live a life that reflects our belief in the word of God. We've got a lot of realizing going on in the last few days, in, the, in these last days. People both here and abroad, denominations and world cultures are receiving the revelation 
of God's truth. But while they're realizing it, they are not being transformed by the power of the truth in the word of God. Amen. And lastly, we cannot be casual with God's doctrine. There's too much casualness with the Lord's word. Amen. Humanity lost out in the garden because a young lady was casual with God's word. Hath God said, that was the question that was proposed to her. And God, and she, and she had, oh, I'm so sorry, she had responded. God has said, um, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest ye die. And all of a sudden, her casualness with the word of God, her casualness with not really knowing the word, her adding just a little bit to the word, got Satan's attention. And because of that, all of humanity had to pay the price for somebody who was casual with God's word. Amen. And so in Revelation 22 and Deuteronomy 4, we are warned not to add to God's word not to take away from it. We don't need to stretch it to make it sound better. We don't need to candy coat it to make it more palatable or aesthetically pleasing. It is perfect just the way it is. Amen. In Ephesians 4.14, it says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. That's exactly what happened in the word of God. She was so, um, in, in the garden, she was so easily deceived, so easily swayed by the enemy of her soul, who was just waiting for the opportunity to twist, to divide, to steal, to kill, and destroy everything that God loves. So I want to talk to you tonight about the six warnings from Hebrews. And instead of calling them warnings, I want to call them admonitions. Because when, you're, when, when you admonish somebody, you're not only warning them, but you're cautioning them. You're cautioning them and you're encouraging them to do what's right and to be careful. Amen. And so the next six admonishments are meant for you to take very seriously and ask God to help you to apply them daily, okay? And so the first one is we need to listen, okay? In Hebrews 2, 1 through 3, it says, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Now, we need to listen to what is being spoken. We need to listen to what is being pre preached. We need to listen very carefully to the word of God. Our lives right now are so busy. And with that busyness is a plethora of voices that are pulling us in every direction. If we are not careful, those voices will drown out um, that still small voice of the Lord that is desperately trying to keep our attention. We cannot allow life's busyness to distract us when we are in the house of God. And it is so easy. That's why we have that time of prayer before we come in. That's why we have a time of worship. Because this world is so full of distractions, we need to get our heart right before we come into the house of the Lord and begin to worship and begin to receive his word. Amen. And so every aspect of church is so important. Pre-service prayer, worship, and the preaching of the word, we need to pray intently. We need to worship wondrously. We need to listen carefully to the word that is being preached. Um, in, verse num in verse two of what I just read, it says, for since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation of disobedience received, it's just reward. What is that saying? 
it's talking about the angels who in heaven were held accountable for their disobedience. And so what we have to understand in Luke 10 and 18, it said, he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. And so we need to realize if the, if the angels in heaven did not have a permanent abode, we, we don't either. We need to take our salvation very, very seriously. Amen. And so if the angels themselves were accountable, who are we to think that we're expected of anything less? Okay, nowhere in the Bible does it say that God left his throne to die for an angel. Nowhere does the Bible allude or state that he allowed himself to be tempted and tried, ridiculed, humiliated, spit upon, beaten, and crucified for any of his angels. But from the old to the new, it is prophesied, it was foretold, and it is recorded that he did it for you and he did it for me. And so that is why if we neglect to listen, if we neglect to ignore the word of God, then we are going to miss this so great salvation. And we're going, to be, we're going to be refused access into heaven. We have to listen. And so I want to admonish you today to listen. Be careful that we don't kind of blow off the things of God. Be careful of dismissing what you are hearing as, oh, that's not for me. We all have to be careful. In Matthew 13, 22, it says, be careful how you hear the word. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it, becoming, it becomes unfruitful. And so how often do we walk into a service and we hear an amazing word of God, a life-changing word of God, and we're like, we got this. We, we, we feel empowered. We feel strengthened. And then we go home, and all of a sudden, things, the pressure start to overwhelm us. The relationships that we had, maybe they're, they're not as good as they were, and, and they're head and sour, and home life is in turmoil, and the jobs and the finances, and all of a sudden, these things, these things in our life are choking out that wonderful word, and we forget to listen. Because what we're listening to now is circumstance. What we're listening to now is our situations, and they are speaking so much louder than the word of God. But the word of God tells me that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I'm going to listen to God no matter if I have to fight to listen. I'm going to listen to the word of God. And I promise you, if you begin to listen and you become a doer, you are going to see every single one of those situations change. Next, I want to admonish you to guard your heart. The Bible says that you need to protect your heart because out of it are all the issues of life. You have to be careful of what you are allowing your heart to meditate upon. Be very, very careful. Hebrews 3 and 7 through 13 says, So, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. What was happening? They were going through it. They kind of did without. I mean, it was not easy for them. But every time it just got a little bit hard, they began to question God. They began to doubt God. They began to kind of speak against the man of God that God placed over their lives. And they began to grieve God in the wilderness. We have wilderness experiences today in our lives. We have to be careful that we don't allow our hearts to be hardened because it says here where your ancestors tested and tried me. You want to test God? I don't want to test God. You want to try God? That doesn't sound like a pleasant testing or trying if you're going to do that with God. And then it says, though for 40 years they saw what I did, that means they saw everything that God did for them. They saw miracles and signs and wonders, and still they tested and they tried God with their disbelief. And their hearts became hardened. And it says, and that is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. We have to be careful what we are speaking when we are going through trials. 
We have to be careful what we are saying out loud. And we have to be careful of what we are housing in our hearts. Because just because you're not saying it, just because you're not speaking it, if you're meditating on that bitterness and and have ought against God in your heart, even though you're not saying it, you don't think God knows? You don't think you're going to start to fester some things in your heart? And all of a sudden, it becomes hard. And so it's a seed to it, brothers and sisters, that not that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin is deceitful. It lies to you. It makes it, the Bible even says that sin is fun for a season. Well, that's not a lie, but you know what? It will destroy you. It is deceiving. Hardness of your heart begins when you continually refuse to obey the will of God or the word of God that is spoken. Whether it's spoken to you personally, you feel like you got a word from God, whether it is spoken from the pulpit, whether it is read in his word during your devotions, If you disobey the word of God continually or ignore what the man of God is teaching or preaching, do you really believe in God's word? Do you really believe in God? Honestly. 1 Corinthians 1.18, and why do I say that? It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. There is an impartation of the power of God in the preaching of the word. That's why you could say, I I was weak, but now I am strong. Amen. I was, I was defeated, but now I'm victorious. It's through the power. It's not, it's not by my power, it's not by might, but it's by his spirit. Thus saith the Lord. It is through the preaching in the word of God. 1 Corinthians one twenty one. for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Listen, if the only word of God that you are getting is from the pulpit, that you're not picking up the word of God at home, you're not reading it, you're not doing your devotions, and the only only word that you're getting is from the pulpit, and you're not even obeying that, it is by the foolishness of preaching that we are saved. Amen? And so... We see here in Jeremiah 3 and 15, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. When you come to the crossroad or a decision in your life, there are only two choices. You will either believe and obey or not believe and disobey. And I'll do it later or I'm not ready yet is a no. And in Proverbs 1, 28, it says, how long, you simple ones, Will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn ye at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. God is speaking to us. He's speaking us on the pulpit. He's speaking us through his word, and he's trying to correct you. He's trying to turn you around so you're going the right way. And so often we get offended by the word of God and we put up that spiritual hand to God and to his word and we're not having it. And we disobey him. And it's saying here that because I have called and he refused, God is always calling you. But you're you're refusing. But she have said it not. Oh, and then it says, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But she have said it not, all my counsels and would none of my reproof. You're not listening to him. You're not listening to what's being spoken. You're not being listening to the word of God. You're just not listening. You want to do it your way. God is trying to to correct us. He's trying to tell us. He's calling us. He's drawing us. 
And what we're doing is we're saying, eh, no. I don't want what you have right now, God. I'm not ready for what you have, or, eh, that's not for me. But it's sitting right here, but I will also, I also will laugh at your calamity. A calamity is coming. It is coming. If you continually disobey the word and you continually want to do it your way, it's going to come out your way. I, I don't know about you, but I want it God's way because God is the only one that really loves me. God is the only one who really knows my beginning from my end and every detail in between. He's the only one whose intentions are so pure, who doesn't have anything in mind other than to love me and to see that I have a life and I have it abundantly. I'm going to trust in him. I don't want my way. But it says here that he's going to laugh at your, at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. God is going to mock you. Because you decided, I want it my way. Haven't you kind of gotten that? You've seen kids do it their way. No matter how many times you've told them not to do it. Okay. And you kind of step back. And then you kind of maybe give, you know, if it's not a bad situation, I told you. They get themselves into a fix. I told you. But if this is more than an I told you so. This is a mocking. And I will laugh. And when your fear cometh as a desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress, listen to me, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then you're going to call upon me. God, God, where are you? God, I need you. God, get me out of this. But it's saying, I'm not going to, he's saying, I'm not going to answer you. This is what you wanted. You wanted your own way. And so now the Bible says that you are going to now be, be filled with the fruit of your own ways. You're going to seek them early but you're not going to find them anymore. In your body, when there is a hardening of your arteries or there's a hardening of your heart, your body can't pump the blood adequately to those areas of your body. I want you to apply that spiritually. When you begin to harden your heart, the blood can't make it to those areas of your life that need it the most, where you need deliverance, where you need help. The blood can't adequately get there because there is a hardness in you. Oh, Jesus, help us. Genesis 6, it says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Every time you resist the Holy Spirit, your heart hardens just a little more, and it gets easier and easier and easier to disobey him. Pretty soon, that ball is not bouncing back as high as it used to, and you find yourself struggling to get into the presence of God more and more. Don't harden your heart. Oh. Next, I want you to grow. We need to grow in the spirit. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God. All over again, you need milk, not solid food. Anyone who, loves on, um, who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use, those are the doers, have trained themselves to distinguish from good and evil. If, you're, if our baby ceases to grow and mature, we take it to the doctor because there's definitely something physically or biologically wrong. When there is a lack of spiritual growth, there is something wrong. 
if you are stagnating and you are in the same place in God and you are struggling with the same thing and you still can't get over the whole, you know, the whole foundational things, then you haven't grown. In Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. You need to lead a life of repentance. You need to be baptized and receive the Holy Ghost. You need to have those foundational principles, but then that's the foundation. Now that is what you need to begin your spiritual life with. That's what you need to begin your relationship with God with. This is what you need to now start to build your walk of God with. It's time to build and grow from that foundation. We have to encourage one another. When we see brothers and when we see sisters in Christ not growing, when we see them stagnating in the things of God, we need to provoke to good works. And sometimes provoking is not meant kindly. If your spirit's not right and you have a brother or sister who loves you and who sees you stagnating and and maybe who sees that you're not growing and you could go to them in love, you may not be received in love. But that's okay because we are to provoke one another to good works. It doesn't matter how people receive. We are to provoke. We are to encourage, amen? We are to to keep praying for people. We're supposed to be their spiritual leaders. Come on, you could do it. Keep pressing forward. It's gonna get better. God's gonna take care of you. God's gonna see you through. Keep walking, keep praying. Don't sit there waiting for, waiting to be fed. Don't, Don't sit there waiting for somebody to come by and give. Be the giver, be the feeder, be the one, amen? Don't wait for God to come to you. Go to God. Develop. Grow in your relationship with him. Exercise what you've learned. Exercise what you've heard. Exercise what you've seen. Paul was upset when he saw the, 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 the condition of the Corinthian church. In 3, 1 through 3, it says, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet are you now able to, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is envying, uh, for there is among ye envying and strife and divisions, are you yet carnal and walk as men? In James 3 and 16, it says, where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. If there's a whole lot of envying and jealousy, if there's a whole lot of contention in your home, then there is a lot of carnality and you are not ready for the meat of the word. You need to go back to the milk. And it doesn't matter what you're professing. You need to go back to the milk of the word. Amen. There was an expectation when he came that he would find more mature saints of God, but instead he found carnality. And what does that mean? Carnality. It means to be fleshly. It needs to be natural. It needs to be worldly, unspiritual, given to temporary passions and appetites. First Corinthians says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. We have to grow spiritually. And lastly, I'm just going to get up to four. The last thing I want you to realize is that I want to admonish you. I want to encourage you to have faith in the finished work of Christ. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. Don't be fake. He knows it. Be sincere. If you're messing up, be sincere. 
if you've been a little haughty, be sincere. If you've been, God, I've been really good, be sincere. I've tried to be, you know, I've tried to follow you. I've tried to do what you've asked me to do. Whatever you do, come before God in sincerity and truth. Amen. And then it says here, it says, um, and 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we professed, profess, for he who promised is faithful. He's faithful. He doesn't lie. Man will let us down. And sometimes they don't mean to, but they'll let us down. But God will not. And let us consider how we may uh, spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Because Christ died for us, because his blood was shed for you and you and you and me. Because of that, you have a new way. You could have a new life. You could have a better life. Why? Because you can boldly and with confidence enter into the presence of God. Do not disregard or dismiss what Jesus has done for you. In Hebrews 10, 26, 27, it says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation, indignation which shall devour his adversaries. And we talked about that in the beginning, how the angels of the Lord were not promised. And they messed up big time. We are not either. And so is your life a mess right now? You may stand, please. Everybody may stand, please. Is your life kind of a mess right now? I want you to stand, and I want you to believe, and I want you to praise him. Is your health failing? I want you to stand, and I want you to believe, and I want you to praise him. Do you have dreams that have not come to pass? I want you to believe anyway. Do you have promises that have not been fulfilled? I want you to praise him and worship him. Do you have emotional wounds? that have not been healed. Worship him and believe that he that created your body could also heal it and will. The Bible says that he has made everything. Everybody say everything. He has made everything beautiful in his time. That's in Ecclesiastes. In Romans 4.21, it says, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Listen, God is going to finish the work that he started in you. He is not man that he should lie. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he says he's going to do through his word, either spoken from the pulpit, in his word, in your devotions, in those places where nobody else is listening to your conversation with God, in the tears that you're crying that nobody else sees, in that still small voice that God is speaking to you, you hold on to those promises. You hold on to his word because God is faithful and just. And he will do what he says he's going to do. So tonight, though it's not complete and though it's not my word, it's somebody else's, but it is the word of God. And in carefulness and in sincerity, I want to admonish you to walk very softly and humbly before the Lord. I want you to listen when God is speaking. I want you to, as much as within you, ask God to keep your heart tender. 
I want you to realize that although it may take some time, what God promises, he will do. And I also want you to realize that God loves you. God loves you. If he's allowing you to go through everything that you're going through, he has already equipped you to get through it. Amen? So right now, I want you just to be thinking about maybe where you're struggling in those areas. Maybe, maybe God, you know what? Maybe I've, I've, I've allowed bitterness to kind of step in a little bit and, and I've hardened my heart because God, it just seems so much easier not to feel the pain. I mean, it seems so much easier, Lord, not to have to deal with the hurt and the waiting and the impatience. And it's just, if I just harden my heart, maybe just a little, maybe I don't have to feel that. Or God, maybe, you know, maybe I haven't been listening as much as I should. Maybe God, you know, every Sunday I'm, I'm, I'm on fire for you and, and, I, and I make promises to you. And, and I, this week, God, I'm going to do it. This week, I'm, I'm going to obey your word. And this week, I'm, I'm, I'm going to listen to what the pastor says. And then, and then Tuesday comes around and you're struggling again. So I want you to kind of think about where you've been at a little bit. Because each of us have been there. Some of us are struggling right now. We're going through the fire. And we're wondering when God's promises are going to come to pass. And we're calling on him. God, I've been patient. God, I'm believing. God, I don't see anything changing right now. 